Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Cambridge Azure 640A and this is the version 1 amplifier and approximate release date for this amp was in 2003 and it's sold in very good numbers and again if people are looking to acquire these normally they're available from many of the auction websites and uh, if you do acquire one which is faulty and there are common issues and one of those common issues will be shown in this repair tutorial and uh, let's just first of all start off just looking at general specifications so in terms of power output for this amplifier it will deliver 65 watts into 8 ohms but that power output increases up to 100 watts per channel if you're using a 4 ohm connected speaker load and then in terms of the phono input stage this is important that for this amplifier, the same as the 540 series, both the Mark 1 or version 1 and version 2, you require the Cambridge Audio Moving Magnet circuit board then to be plugged in directly. So even though when you look at the front panel it says AUX stroke phono and also from the rear, if the board is not installed, then it is just operating as the other inputs. All right, so these are your higher level input signals. So if it did have the optional phono, then it'd be 1.75 millivolts then. And then in terms of total harmonic distortion, a very good specification, so it's 0.005%. And then uh, you have separate bass and treble controls and also balance. And then you have the ability to go direct mode. So this is where it will eliminate the tone control circuits. And it's common with all of these amplifiers. You also have a headphone socket if you want to have uh, private listening and full remote control so not only the input selection but you can also turn the amplifier into standby mode and also operate the volume control and then dimensions 430 millimeters by 320 by 100 and then overall weight is 7 kilograms so when this amplifier came into the workshop um, first initial inspection identified that two of the power input protection fuses had blown. So this is FU1 and FU2 and the rating of these are fast blow and they are 20 millimeter fuses and the rating is 6.3 amps and those fuses um, protect the output stage of the amplifier so this is where you have the higher current feed to the power amplifier stages and as I said what the video is showing you here are the two blown fuses so they've vaporized and for people who have attended previous tutorials that indicates normally excess current consumption it's not maybe you had a surge on power up indicating a, a potential then for a short circuit so visual inspection checking over the board just to make sure that i can see any sort of burnt out components nothing obvious straight away but what I did see is this common issue then with the brown glue and um, we'll come back to that in a little while. So by doing the initial checks with the multimeter what I could confirm um, reasonably quickly was that the output transistors or one of the output transistors on the left hand channel was short circuit and these are the ones where you have the SAP15N and SAP15P and these are the Sanken devices uh, and this is common these were used on the Cambridge A5 A500 amplifiers and also used on the 540 and then the 640 series as well then and then um, once I just identified that the output was one of the output channels was then short circuit um, the next thing really to do is to take them out because I really didn't have any history about this amplifier so it may well have other issues so by removing the output transistors what I'm able to do then via the dim bulb tester is power up the amplifier and sure enough all came up good and then what I was then able to do was to apply an audio signal connect headphones and then check to see if the right channel was working and it was you know I could select the different input channels so no issue there I could also select the speaker set 2 mode and again I've got audio on the output stages uh, no distortion everything good so the main area of focus really was to first of all repair this output stage so powering down the amplifier and then what the video shows also is the state of the board so quite immediately when you sort of remove the multiple ray of screws probably about 
uh, I think probably in total probably about 16 screws underneath and then you have to release the plastic mounting clips and then once I turned the board over what you could see is a previous repair attempt had been done um, probably not, not the best I've ever seen so of course desolder the uh, failed power output transistors and then install the new one so here the um, silicon conductive compound heat seat compound needed to be replaced then you have a mica washer which is their insulation between the back of the power transistors and the heat sink and then you just need to bend the leads over um, you can just use that just with a pair of long nose pliers and then once you push them through into the board you have to then fit the screw which engages them with a locking nut underneath now because of the nature of the previous repair attempt what you could see what you can see is some of the solder tracks have been damaged so rather than just sort of bend the leads over and then scrape away some of the protective coating to expose the copper track and then solder onto there you you need to bear in mind that these are power transistors and what i'm not going to do is you know bend the leads over and then solder them on because that's not going to provide you know a robust kind of repair you know it's, it's sort of leaving it open to uh, future failure so as insight, what you need to do, and I always keep a bag of these, are just component leads which I cut off, you know, when fitting different parts. And then what I then do is I just simply make a, a hoop, and then I can then wrap that directly around the component lead. So here, for these power output transistors, you have five terminals, and then connect that lead directly to the solder track. And that provides a very, very strong mechanical um, connection and then any excess flux was then removed with um, these or, or flux remover I then power up the amplifier and then again via the dim ball tester I can just monitor to make sure that there was no excess current drawn and there was none everything was fine and then what I did do is just to make an initial adjustment then on the bias so you're looking at the SAP 15N and then you have on this channel R100 which is 0 0.22 ohm power resistor at 3 watts. So you just connect your multimeter across there, set it to millivolts and then you adjust it then to a nominal value. Your N value will be 13 millivolts for both channels. Here I did to approximately 11 millivolts because I've got some degree of current limiting via the dim bulb although you don't see it lighting. And then I'm confident and uh, you know that that's working fine. There wasn't any other components that had burnt out in the output stage, so a little bit strange why someone would try to make a repair attempt and maybe they never did replace the power output transistors. But because they'd already replaced the silicon conductive uh, compound for the heating compound, what I was able to do was to really uh, remove, not remove all, lift up the other two power transistors for the other channel, and again just replace that heating compound so you've got extremely good thermal transfer now i said at the beginning of the video that there was one of the common issues that you see with these amplifiers and it's a little bit unfortunate for customers who've purchased these amps because i'm fully convinced that if this brown glue issue and they've never used it to provide any form of mechanical strength i'm confident that these amplifiers would probably run maybe 20 30 years or maybe more uh, it's just a shame that they use this rubberized glue initially which dries out very very hard and it becomes almost like a, a plastic but it, it's highly corrosive and also conductive as well so what we're showing here in the video is R43 and R43 is a 150 ohm resistor and what it does is it drops or it supplies the power then from the main rail which is about 45 volts and then drops the voltage down initially then to provide or to provide the power then to the pre-amplifier stage in the main output and once that brown glue is covering any component over time it for the resistor it will make it go open circuit even if it was maybe a semiconductor what you'll find it literally eats away at the electrical uh, component connection and if it's a diode then when you touch the diode the diode just breaks away just sort of crumbles so here if you're going to take that work you've got to put some longevity into the repair so just wear eye protection and then you can go in there then with a plastic scraping tool and you can remove all of these flakes of glue 
Once that's done, here I'll replace the 150 ohm resistor which was shown in the video, and that makes sure that future wise, you know, you're not going to have a failure down to the brown glue. Because this glue had dried out, it becomes flaky. So just be aware that as you're removing this glue, flex of this glue can lift up and you need to avoid it going underneath any of the component leads because it's conductive. If that happens, then you're going to see other issues. And it's a common failure with the amplifier where you get random operation of the protection mode because of this glue. So you, you see that. And then the other part of the service and repair was to take care of the input power relay and then also the speaker protection relay. Now, I often get asked questions, you know, wh why do you do that? You know, was the relay faulty when you come to test it? No. So why would you replace it? If you think how many operations of that relay have occurred since uh, 2003, it would literally be hundreds of thousands where the user is switching the amplifier maybe to... Um, standby mode and how this amplifier works is that you have the power going through to the microprocessor it will then illuminate the standby led on the front panel and then when you initiate either from the remote control or from the front panel it will energize the power relay which is shown on the power input board and in turn as the contacts close it will provide mains power to the large toroidal transformer so there's a lot of current and these contacts wear and then become resistive and in some cases you can also see erratic operation. The same also applies for the same relay, it's the same uh, type of relay, same manufacturers used for the speaker protection relay. And for the version 1 series or Mark 1 series of these amplifiers, there is only one relay. On the version 2, you could switch between the uh, speaker set 1 speaker set 2 via the remote control, but here it's a manual selection. So again, why would you replace that relay? Well, the contacts become worn and resistive, as I said. And when you're dealing with audio signals, what you don't want to have is intermittent signal loss. And you can see this in all amplifiers that use speaker protection relays, you will get intermittent operation, or if the signal level is maybe at very low volume, it sounds distorted because the signal is trying to pass over what should be a uh, contact as close to zero ohms as possible but it's x number of, of ohms so it's become resistive as i said so it can lead then to distortion then so here really to sort of recap on this repair multiple things were done so first of all the issue with the blown fuses was due to short circuit then of the output transistors so both of them had to be replaced a point to emphasize just source genuine original sanken devices i've mentioned this previously there are always counterfeit devices on the market so just avoid them if you can get pulled originals means they've come from original equipment still working then fit those you don't want to have anything in there which is counterfeit and then once the output transistors have been replaced then the bias output for both channels is set then to 13 millivolts make sure you have nothing connected in terms of speakers or input signal set your volume control to minimum and then your balance, treble, and bass control should be set then to midpoint. Once that's done, and I mentioned it again, I just simply powered up the amplifier without the output transistors in there, just to verify that there was no issue with the other channel, which there wasn't. And then, just to add that longevity, I'm looking across and I can see this brown glue. That gets removed completely, and then any components where have been covered by the brown glue were replaced here. It was only the 100 ohm resistor, which is R43. And then finally, I then replaced the speaker protection relay and then also the power input relay. And then final is just to clean the user controls and switches. So I sprayed the oxid into there, just to use maybe some kitchen roll um, just to take any excess away. And then you just work the potentiometers backwards and forwards or operate the switches multiple times and then you should be rewarded with noise-free operation then. And that's it. That's sort of this repair tutorial complete. And as always, I really appreciate you stopping by. What I would also say is if you have any questions at any time, please, by all means, come back and email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com, and I'll be more than happy to provide any insight or guidance. 
So thanks very much. Until the next time, cheers. Bye-bye.